We're in Psalm 23 tonight. Psalm 23. Um, I, I love this psalm. It's, it's beautiful. We have um, heard it a hundred times over. Um, but I wanted to look at it because I, uh, I saw something in it again in, in studying uh, for this that, um, that really just struck me. And um, I'm going to be relying a lot tonight on the Holman Old Testament commentary. So that's what I'll be reading from just because it has a really good, good summary of the little parts that we're going to be looking at. But just kind of an opening question. Um, what memories do you have of the 23rd Psalm? And what comes to mind when you think about the 23rd Psalm? What memories are, are there that you have? Anything? I used to is have that a shepherd? Little... The shepherd. I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, I used to have a little uh, bookmark that had a sheep on the top of it. Okay, so you had the bookmark with the verse. sheep on it. Yeah, with the verse. What else? Anybody have anything at home that has the Lord's Prayer? Or not the Lord's Prayer, but the um, 23rd Psalm on it? <coughs> Anybody got, you know, one of those? I know that it's probably somewhere. If we go into our homes right now, somewhere in there, there's probably something. There's a card. Um, there's a bulletin. There's a... Um, there's that cross stitch yet. Cross stitch, yeah. There's something, <laughs> something like that that has... Um, that it has that. So what what do we where do we usually see the twenty third Psalm? Where do we usually see it or hear it? Where, where's one of those places that we see it or hear it? I know this for me. Um, probably the most uh, present time of the twenty third Psalm is is at a funeral. Um, it's usually I mean it's one of the scriptures that is read very often at, at a funeral. Um, we usually see it on posters. We see a, we see a shepherd holding a sheep. Um, tonight, as we look at the 23rd Psalm, it has six verses. So we're going to look at six parts of it. Six part of, parts of this psalm that deals with the Lord, our shepherd, and the Lord, our host, and how he takes care of us. So we've got one, two, three. We've got six people here tonight, so that's good. So we got six verses. So, uh, Linda, I'll ask you if you will. We'll go all the way around. So if you will, read verse 1 for us. This is God's position and provision. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. All right. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I shall not want. Um, there's a, there is a version that um, of the Bible that says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I thought that was a really good translation. Notice, notice this. David begins this psalm by introducing the first metaphor that describes the relationship between the Lord and his people with the tender analogy of a shepherd and his flock. During his youth, David had been a shepherd watching his father's flock, so he was very familiar with this picture. Transferring the image to God, he declared, the Lord is my shepherd, the word my emphasizes how deeply personal and close was his individual relationship with God. Everything in the next four verses flows out of this shepherd's motif. What is so amazing is that in ancient Israel, a shepherd's work was considered the low, lowest of all work. A shepherd would actually live with his sheep 24 hours a day with unwavering devotion day and night, both in fair weather and bad, to nurture, guide, and protect his sheep. The shepherd would assume full responsibility for the needs and safety of his flock, even risking his own life for their protection. This is what God has chosen to be for his people. He is their everything, their constant protector. Because of the greatness of God and his constant loving care over his flock, David concluded, I shall not be in want. Left to themselves, sheep lack everything. Being totally helpless and defenseless animals who cannot uh, care for themselves. But under the shepherd's care, all their needs are abundantly met. So it was for David. 
as well as for all believers who are under the uh, under God uh, under God's watch care. Uh, he is all all sufficient. He is inexhaustible and unchanging. All God's sheep, precious to Him, shall not be in want. They lack nothing that is good and necessary for enjoying life to the fullest. I love I love how that kind of went in there and went to the background there. So in, in thinking about all of those things, what do you think came to mind when David thought of a shepherd? What do you think David came, what, what came to David's mind? You got to take care of them? Uh, somebody, something to take care of. That's right. You think of a shepherd, that's, that's their job, taking care of sheep. What else? You think he uh, he might have thought about what he had to do as a shepherd? Think about um, I, I know I know with us the the only real animal we've really really taken care of we've taken care of a fish but we've taken care of a dog. You think about all the stuff a dog needs. Dog needs food, exercise, vets, love. You know you, you got to do certain things for for a dog that way. You have to do certain things for a horse, for goats, for chickens, for Bees, you have, you have to take care of them. So David most likely thought of all the things a shepherd had to do. What do you think it meant to David when he wrote that the Lord was his shepherd? What do you think he was thinking about? God took care of him. God was the one that was going to take care of him. What else? Guidance. Well, okay. He was going to be the guide because the shepherd guides. Shepherd says, hey, let's go this way, go that way. I'm thinking about this way, what about this? That God is our physician. When you think about your doctor, what do you usually think about? Other than doctor's bills. <laughs> and they will go, boom, doctor's bills. Do you think about maybe what, why you've got to go see the doctor? You know, we have general physicians that we go to for, um, for regular checkups, but think about the specialist we go to for, you know, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Well, they, when you have a problem, they, they know how to fix it. That, that's or, where you're like going to them. They, they, yeah, you, got, you have your, your problem and they're going to fix it, whether it be... Like I said, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. You think David might have gone, you know what? The Lord is my shepherd. I got to go to him with all my problems. I got to go to him for, for all of those things. How is God our shepherd? How is it that God is our shepherd? We know he's always watching over us. We're having time to do it like, like when we fasten our doors at night, like when we feel like that we're secure, that the Lord is with us, is we, 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 that's one of our things we use is taking care of us. Yep. I think you're absolutely right there. And A he, shepherd. Uh, I just thought in the end he's going to fix it all and yep. we'll have it all good. A yeah, shepherd is something that is someone that protects the sheep. So anything that we can say of a, a shepherd, we can say of God. So God's the one that protects us, right? He's the one that guides us. He's the one that provides for us. He's the one that directs us in our life. He's the one that brings us through the good times and the bad times. He's the one that provides us food. That is, that's, a, that's a big thing to think about when we think about the Lord being our shepherd what do you think it means? We shall not want. That's an interesting one. It's one of the most well-known Bible verses that we've got. But we shall not want. What does it mean? What's that deep meaning of it? He's always, to me, he's always going to give us everything that we need. Um, I mean, oh, yeah. we're not going to want anything because we're going to have it because he's going to give it to us. I'm reminded the Bible says, My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That whenever we go through this life, 
God provides just what we need at just the right time. Um, we uh, were, were planning on, on beach trip stuff, and um, we were out on Friday. Make sure I get my days right. We were out on Friday, and one of the things that I wanted, I wanted to get for the, for the beach was I wanted to get a small cooler. Um, cause at, at the beach house, there's a big, massive one, but you know, we don't, you don't need like, I'm not going out to the beach for like four or five days. I wanted, I wanted something that I could take, you know, some sandwiches or something and, and a little bit of this and that. So I wanted one of particular size. And, um, I was like, you know what, we're going out there and we're going to go look. And lo and behold, we went to a thrift store in Burlington and we're looking around, looking around, and I go up to, uh, I go up to where they have the coolers, and there is one, because I knew how big it needed to be, it was within the inch of how big it needed to be, and it was $2. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm like, you know what, the Lord provided. But isn't that, isn't that how God does things? We're so glad. That must have been one of them like <laughs> You know, it wasn't, it was an older cooler, it had some age on it. But lo and behold, it was, I mean, it had some age, but it was perfect for what we wanted. And, but that's the way God does it. He, I didn't think it, you know, the odds of just stumbling upon the perfectly right cooler, because that was the only place that had coolers. That was, there was no other place that had any cooler. And we no, maybe about, one or two that had we, big, massive ones. Right, but we went to about four or five thrift stores. We were trying to get yeah. jean shorts for this job. Yeah. <laughs> but lo and behold, the very perfect one was there, just sitting there. And lo and behold, it didn't even have a price tag on it. I had to go up to the register, and I said, it has no price tag. She looked at it and said, $2. I was like, we're good. Yep. I, she would say a lot more than that. I've been happy with it. But that's the way God works, in that manner, in that shape and form. He just provides exactly what we need, the right person, the right place, just right when we need it. How can God, being our shepherd, change our attitude in trials and tribulations? How can, he, how can that mentality of God is our shepherd, how can that change our attitude about in trials and temptations? It gives us a peaceful uh, attitude. And, and no worry. Absolutely. Because we know God's taking care of it. And what about this? What can the words, I shall not want, how can that help bring us through difficult times? I would say it's a decision you have to make. Because you can whine all you want, but you have to decide that you're not going to do that. Huh. Um. I, I, lady, you got to say that whining ain't fixing me. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not any better because I'm whining. <laughs> when I was in um, when I was in elementary school, kindergarten, first, second grade, I was at uh, Alamance Christian School, and when you went to when you were dismissed, your um, you went out on the front steps of the school, and they had this big line. The the school had a big a circular, almost circular driveway. And all the parents would come in on one side and they'd go around to the front, You, they'd get you, and then they'd go around to the front. They'd go on out. And um, kids, we could always watch. You can always watch the road in the very back and you could watch the cars and I knew what my mother's, I knew what my mother's car looked like. Uh, very first one I remember, she had a green Pinto that she, she absolutely loved. And then, um, you know, you see, see it go and pass by. It went to a minivan. It went to a bunch of stuff. But you always knew that car. Well, if, if mom wasn't there on time, I had an internal timer. It was better than Rolex. I'd get worried. Yeah. Oh, no, mom's not here. Oh, no, what do I do? They done forgot me. They done forgot me. <laughs> Here's the thing. I had completely forgotten and kicked out this idea. My mom loves me, and she's not going to forget me at school. That was the idea. I shall not want. It's remembering God is providing for us, that he loves us, and he is going to be there for us through it. Number two is God's protection and peace. Tommy, would you read verse number two for us? I'll read it. 
Oh, you read it? All right. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Amen. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. God's protection and peace. Listen to what the commentary says here. Continuing the shepherd's theme, David boasted, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Sheep are fearful animals. Easily panicked and when scared will not lie down to rest. Only the shepherd can provide the calm assurance to make them lie down in green pastures or grassy meadows. This speaks of the peace and true satisfaction that only God can provide his sheep. What is more, David said, he leads me beside quiet waters. Literally, this refers to waters that have been stilled. Further expanding this peaceful scene, weary and worn sheep need a long, refreshing drink from the rapid stream. But being instinctively afraid of running water, the shepherd must pick up a current and create quiet water. Or, excuse me. The shepherd must pick up a few large stones and dam up a place, causing the rushing stream to slow its current and create quiet waters. Then the flock may drink with no fear. God gives true, abiding peace to believers who abide in him and drink of his grace. I thought that was... That's pretty interesting. That's, a, that's interesting to think about sheep that way. Here's the thing. When you think about the sheep, when you think about these sheep running around, they're nervous. They got, you know, a wolf has come or a lion or, or something has come and scared them. What do you think a sheep has to do or a shepherd has to do to calm down the flock? What, what do you have to do? I mean, sing to them. Sing to them. <laughs> you know what? There are shepherds that do sing. I know um, professors in, in seminary mentioned that. Well, and that, uh, you have to admit that's what most of the songs well, they try yeah. to keep That was them. what he was doing. The shepherd tries to keep them heard. Yep. Keep them together. together. Uh, if he can keep them together in a clump, yeah. they say. Yep. If one wings off to the side, he's in the. He's in the open game. Mm -hmm. Just like that little rabbit, John. He's been standing up listening to you preach. <laughs> He's welcome to come on in, too. <laughs> but, you know, you think about an animal that gets frightened. Um, any, any type of animal that gets frightened. What do you do? You kind of soothe it. You do whatever soothes that animal. Um, a horse, it might be, you know, you, you groom it. A dog is the same way. I don't know with a cat. I have no idea. I don't Most know. of your animals, they like to be in a group. Yeah. When they they're safety. If they're that safety. If they're like say if he breaks off, he's in the danger zone of getting get be got. Yep. It, you think about this too. In times of crisis, in rough, rough going, and rough times, as a church, what do we usually do? We come together. We come together. There's something innate within us because when we come together, there's comfort in that. We, we come together for a prayer meeting. We come together for a special service. We come together and we just want to be. What, what have we wanted to do for like the last three months is we've just wanted to get everybody together. And I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to have a big old fellowship meal where we're all just elbow to elbow eating good food and talking and, and hearing that din of people um, going up? We long for it. Those are the things that, well, that actually answers that next question. How does God help us lie down in green pastures? He comforts us. He gets us together. Um, what types of things do we not do? We know a sheep won't lie down in green pastures. What do we not do when we're not at peace? What kind of things do we not do? If we're not, if we're restless, worry. you worry. Uh, do you sleep well? No. Yeah. Do you sleep? Do you eat well? No. 
might eat too much or might eat, not eat at all. Yeah, you might overeat, you might not eat enough. You're not saying, boy, let me go get this salad with a nice vinaigrette dressing on it. You, you go, no, give me the fried chicken and the fries and the fried pecan pie. And We do things to, we're restless in other ways, aren't we? It's not, you know, oh, look, there's the lawn. Let me lie down in it. We do things that are restless. How does God help us still the waters of our life that we might have peace? You figure that, that shepherd had to pick up a big stone and put it in a stream and kind of make that little pool, dam it up a little bit and just put a little pool down there so that the sheep can drink. What does God help us do to calm us down? What internally ha kind of happens in our hearts and our minds? We, re we remember who he is because it's so easy to forget uh, the reminder of who he is and how he's in control uh, is what calms us back down. Mm -hmm. uh, you ever had a Bible verse just like smack you? I mean, it was like you hadn't read you hadn't read that chapter in that verse in like four years, but you remember you remember reading it. But then God just like boom, right up, right up. He's like, hey, remember this? I had that happen um, last Sunday. Um, Grace was texting back and forth with her cousin, and um, uh, a verse in the book of James popped up, verse nineteen and twenty. Uh, let every man be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. I've read that, I don't know how many times, but I hadn't read it recently um, at all. And in, in thinking about that, I was like, that's the Holy Spirit just smacking me up, in the, up you know, and reminding me of that truth. Sometimes he reminds us who we are, who he is. And that Bible verses that draw us back, and that can calm us. Um, I, I've had him do that many a time when chaos kind of reigns. So how can we go to God? When, when we are restless and we need to lie down in green pastures, what can we do to seek God's help? We talk to him. Yeah. Oh, prayer's, prayer's huge, isn't it? What else? Spend extra time with them and, and I praise him. Yeah. Oh, isn't praising good? Praising you ever um, ever turned the radio on and started hearing some like really good gospel music, and you just gotten in a better mood? Just, you know, Cathedral Quartet or I admit, Kingsmen I, I or had, I had brought one of the, choir, the new choir CDs home, and uh, I was cleaning the living room this morning, and I just played it nice and loud. She was in the shower. Ah, <laughs> good okay. loud, and I just sang with it. Yep. I could hear you. <laughs> when she can hear her in the shower, <laughs> so hey, cranking it up. But that's that's how we seek God and find rest. But that's also how we how we have peace. Um, we can easily find that rest in prayer and in searching the Word of God. Let's go to move. Let's move to number three real quick. Lillian, would you read verse number three for us? I'm not sure where I'm at. Number three. We're at the number top three. of the third page. What verse? Top of number the third three. Page. Uh, top, of the top, page. top of the page. It says, yeah. God's it. grace, guidance, and glory. Number three. He restores my soul. So what you yeah, mean? that one. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. There we go. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I always thought this was the um, this was the hard verse of uh, of this because when I memorized it, I think when I was in kindergarten, righteousness was such a hard word to say. Um, we had nothing to do with what it meant or anything, but it was a hard word to say. Listen to what it says here. Moreover, the good shepherd restores my soul. The statement is subject to different interpretations. It may picture the strange sheep being brought back to the fold. In Hebrew vernacular, these words can mean brings to repentance or brings to conversion. Psalm 19 and verse 7 uses the same wording, to picture the spiritual renewal or revival of a believer. But since the word for soul is uh, accurately translated life, this may mean that the Lord restores the psalmist to physical hell. Either interpretation is certainly true. Furthermore, David wrote, The Lord guides me in paths of righteousness. 
Unlike other animals, sheep lack a sense of direction and can easily become lost, even in the most familiar environment. They easily go astray as they are prone to wandering. The shepherd must continually guide them to paths of righteousness or the right path. If they are to be moved from field to field without falling into deep crevices or off ragged cliffs. Likewise, God, by his word and spirit, guides his flock effectively in the right way. All this God does for his name's sake, meaning for the honor of his uh, own glory, which is the highest of all his motives. Even when believers sin, God is committed to leading them back to the right path. Think about his grace, his guidance, and his glory. Think about this. When, when we read, he restores my soul, think about all the different things God restores in our life. What, what kind of things does God restore in people's lives? Health. He restores health, absolutely. We've seen many, many a time God gets us through times of sickness and restores our health. What else is, does he restore? It doesn't have to just be with our physical bodies. It can be socially, too. Work ability. Okay. Ability to do things. Does he restore relationships? Sure he does. He restores a relationship with God. Yeah. With relationships here, but also relationships here, with God and with others. Um, he, re he restores marriages, um, relationships with children. Um, he restores uh, in the fact that he can offer forgiveness, restoring relationships with him. Um, he can restore a new passion in your life, um, a ministry. He can restore um, memory. He can restore, he restores a lot of things, doesn't he? Um, and, and those things that we talk about that he restores, those are things only really he can restore, isn't it? He's restoring a lot of people's minds now mm -hmm. in this uh, corona. And he's, he's restored a lot of them, but a lot of them are not. Well, you think about the idea of people being restored, a lot of times they, they come back to him and begin listening again and beginning to get back into the Word of God and getting back on that right path. That's God restoring those souls. Um, so when we look at that particular verse, what does it mean? I don't, I don't think there's a wrong interpretation in respects of, does he restore life? Yes. Does he restore the soul of an individual? Yes. Does he restore health? Absolutely. He restores all these things. Um, so I think that's really, that's really an important um, this is an important matter right there. How about the soul? Oh, yeah. He restores the soul. Um, we, we, the idea of, of God bringing salvation. He, he's able to restore life to that soul uh, of an individual. Um, what does this verse reveal to us about the purpose of God's guidance? The purpose of why God guides and directs us. He wants to lead us in the right way. Yep. He leads us in the paths of righteousness down follow, the right. We need to follow some guidelines and all and, and try to feel like that we're doing going the right way. And for his name's sake and yeah. to uh, um to praise him and worship mm -hmm. him and, and maybe lead others to him and mm -hmm. tell others about him. It says that it, for his name, he brings glory to himself. It's a focus on him instead of us. Mm -hmm. The yeah, it, it's the idea. We we get so oh yeah confused with our own selves that really the focus is supposed to be on him. Yeah. It's the uh, it's the idea that it's, so often we make things about us. I mean, I get into that. Oh, I'll I'll stumble into that so often, and um, and go in and. And say, hey, it's about me. It's you know, I want, I want to think, but I have to remind myself. Wait a minute here. Wait a minute. Hold on. It's all about God. It's all about His glory. It's all about His honor. It's all about everything that He does. So that as God leads us, 
we know he's reading it, leading us on the right path. Um, it's uh, it's leading us in the in the right way in doing the right thing. But um, huh? I can see the rabbit now. You can see the rabbit now. <laughs> if the rabbit wants to come, we we will welcome the rabbit, and and we'll go. I mean, I. <laughs> he's coming on up. He is. Maybe he's a good oh, Baptist rabbit. That's right, he's a Baptist rabbit. He, he needs some uplifting. See his little ears? He wants we, to get educated. Oh, you know what? Yeah. See? Uh -huh. You know? He wants to while he does this, he'll stand up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we can see all creatures of our God and King. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, it's one of the creatures of the God and King right there. He might be a good Baptist rabbit. He's That's all right. For a shepherd. That's, <laughs> I don't know. Do rabbits have shepherds or do they? Might be trying to tell us something. <laughs> what would be funny is if we had like a sheep farmer next to the church and we have all the sheep coming up here. Uh, but we look at it, God is he, He's one that leads us on the right paths. And that focus is the purpose. That That's the last, the idea there. That it really does focus us back saying, you know what? My life, I can't, I can't make my life about me. I got to make my life about somebody else. I got to make it about God and, and His glory. So let's let's move to number four. Let's move to the fourth fourth verse. God's security, safety, and strength. Grace, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you. Can you uh, would you mind reading verse four real loud and proud, like you do at school? <laughs> okay. Yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow and death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Thank you, sweetheart. Verse 4, uh, this, is, uh, this is good. Taking this image a step further, David portrayed the shepherd as being able to protect his sheep in their moments of greatest danger. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, David stated, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The shepherd would lead his flock from through a narrow valley between the high jagged cliffs, often filled with potential dangers such as wild animals. The sun would be obstructed from shining into the valley, creating darkness or a shadow. Such a shadow in the valley would often become a place of death for wandering sheep. Hence a shadow of death. Yet even in such danger, the Lord was present to guard and guide his flock, dispelling all fear of evil as he led them into the paths of righteousness. Keeping with this shepherd imagery, David declared, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd's rod was usually an oak club about two feet long. It was used to defend the flock against wild animals such as lions or bears, as well as for counting, guiding, and protecting his sheep. And the shepherd's staff was his crook. Bent or hooked at one end, it was used to pry sheep loose from thickets, to push brushes aside or branches aside, to pull fallen sheep out from holes, to lead them along narrow paths, and to drive off snakes. Such tools were sources of comfort for fearful sheep and for David. He lived his life often surrounded by multiple dangers, yet God's word and loving hand were the most effective means of guiding and guarding his faithful servant, David. That's beautiful in imagery. How many of y'all knew the, uh, the, what the rod was? I knew what the staff was, the shepherd's crook. How many of y'all knew what the rod was? I thought they were both the same thing. Yeah, uh, and, and there, you know, it's the idea that you got to go back into the time of the shepherd. But lo and behold, shepherds weren't just, you know, maybe we ought to do that on our, um, uh, on our Christmas plays. We give all the boys that are playing the shepherds, we give them that, but we give them the give big club too. <laughs> I see no problems that could arise whatsoever with giving them, no giving them things like that. Love that. Here is your shepherd's crook. Now here's your club. All right, go up there. And it'd make it a lot more entertaining. Um, when we're talking about this, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip just a couple of, uh, couple of our questions. Um, uh, well, no, I want to do this. What does this verse say about the life we're living? 
specifically with it saying, yea, though I walk. What does that say about the life we're living? It, it's already happening. It, it's, I'm going through it. Life's a journey, isn't it? We, we don't stay in the same place. We go places. You know, I, I, I didn't stay where I was born. Thankfully, it's not a hospital anymore. It's a social security building now, but I didn't stay where I was born. I moved. Uh, moved a couple of different places. But he does have ways of slowing us back. Yes. And it, I think it, right it, now we are going through yes. that slowdown period. We're coming back yeah. where life used to be. And I'm afraid it's going to be that way for a while. These young people are going to have to accept some of this stuff. I, I agree. Sometimes we can go too fast. Now, Shepard, get that crook back. And, no, you come on back here. Yeah, come back here with me. We, well, life is a journey, and that's one of the things, too, in thinking about the idea of a shepherd. The shepherd sets the pace, right? You know, the sheep might say, hey, I know, look at that green, green grass over there. I want to take off. But if they get too far ahead of the shepherd, they're in danger. Same is if they lag too far behind, they're in danger as well. So the idea is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the only way we have no fear is if God is with us. What kind of valleys do we walk through in life? We're going through one now. We've got COVID-19. We've got uh, a, lot of, a lot of protests going that, that are ending in, that are bringing forth violence, which is really bad. We have a lot of chaos going on on Capitol Hill. What other things do we, we go through in life? Have you ever been to the hospital? Yeah. Not a fun time, is it? The kind of life you're living that's not suitable for, for what you're supposed to be, what you're trying to do. A lot of times, a lot of times that can bring us to valleys. You want to live for the Lord, but mm -hmm. you've got something else that you'd rather be doing than to live for the Lord. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, you can't stand straddle the fence. Uh, yeah, you can't, yes, you can't straddle the fence there. You've got to be one way or the other here. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> well, I think one valley is finance is one thing. There's a lot of people in now. That's in one of the valleys. What? Oh, uh, another valley, I think, is where we can uh, not hug and oh, goodness. all that stuff. And, and all these people who have passed away that we haven't actually been able to yep. um, you know, spend time with the family or... Um, Try to comfort them or yep. whatever. It's, it's just, uh, it's just hard. Social know? distance is a valley. Not being able to be close to the ones you really want to be close to. But death is a valley. Um, grief is a valley. Um, all of those things are valleys. But here's the thing. Here's, here's what I love. How does God answer this question? Why can we go through this life without fear? It's answered in verse 4. It's right there. You're with me. You are with me. That The presence of God, Look. you can get through this because God is with you. Um, my favorite Bible verse, Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Um, what does Jesus say at the end of, the, uh, of Matthew? Um, and lo... I am with you until the end of the age. Um, to the end of all time, basically, is what he's saying. God's presence is really what gets us through everything. Um, I'm going to skip the, one of the questions here. I'm going to go on to the application. Um, I, I'm going to go to the very last ones. The most important words are, you are with me. Um, what does this verse teach us about how to fight the battles of our life? How do we fight the battles of our life based on this verse? Be strong. Fight the battles. How do we fight battles in our life? To be strong. Sometimes I get down about this whole situation mm -hmm. and, and, and worry, but then I have to tell myself God is in control. That I do. I don't have to worry about it. God is going to take care of everything. Yeah. Uh, I think my biggest problem is being lonely but you don't ever have to be lonely because he's right here yeah. mm -hmm. you can talk to him anytime and the holy spirit can talk back to you 
So uh, I think God's been teaching me a lot of that, uh, just getting close to Him and a close relationship. So here, here's the here's the question. This isn't on the paper, but uh, it's pretty good. Have you ever seen a sheep fight? <laughs> what, what what does a sheep do to fight? Does it bite? Does it does it? Oh, they butt. They head butt. It's like a goat go fighting. Go back to that. Why can we go through this life without fear? Uh huh. Because God is with us. Yeah. That's the idea. When when David said, "Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm I will fear. fear no evil, for Thou art with me." The idea that the presence of God is really what it allows us the opportunity to to get through all of those things. And that's the idea. And the other, the idea too, and the idea of um, of fighting battles. One of the things that David was saying here, with God as my shepherd, God's the one that's going to fight the battles. Um, sheep can, you know, you can get headbutt. You fought a sheep. Did you win? No, you didn't win. Okay. You can get a rematch, I guess. Uh, oh, boy, because this one, Philip had a bat. This, one's a, this is real, too. Uh -huh. He just walked by and ran. You'd be standing there, and you'd think he was real friendly, and then he'd go, boom, right, <laughs> right. He'd do a stink attack on you. <laughs> the, the idea of, um, of the shepherd, when, when somebody, when a predator came, the shepherd was the one that was taking care of it, right? Shepherd had the rod and would go after it. And not the sheep. A lot of times we've got to we've got to remember God fights so many battles, and we've got to let Him do that in so many places. Sweetheart, will you read verse five? This is God's table, God's oil, and God's drink. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Okay. David shifted metaphors from the shepherd flock motif to the host Im imagery. As a gracious host would attend to the needs of his guest, so David said to God, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Though surrounded by many enemies who sought to harm him, David recognized that God was with him for his good, supplying his needs as a host would care for a guest. Again, the same central theme of this psalm is reinforced. Even under the most adverse circumstances, in the face of threatening enemies, David would lack nothing. It was the custom of a loving host to provide oil for the head of his honored guest to refresh him after his travels. Then David added, You anoint my head with oil. Speaking of the Lord's ministry to revive his heart, especially when surrounded by many foes who threatened him, the presence of God invigorated him, renewing him for all the demands of life. Further, David testified, My cup overflows, referring to the constant supply of drink provided by an attentive host. His cup was always more than filled to the brim, overflowing with the most satisfying drink imaginable. This pictures the abundant supply of divine grace in David's life, which was more than sufficient to strengthen and sustain him in the most dangerous circumstances. God is an infinite source of all that believers need to live victoriously in difficult situations. I love that imagery there. When, you say, when they say, you know, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, what type of provisions do you think God would set in front of you when you have enemies all around? I don't think it'd be sliced ham, even though it'd be delicious. What do you think he would provide? Armor? Armor? How about protection? Yeah. What else? How about promises? They're they're not gonna overcome you. Offense. Offense. How about protection? Yep. You. Protection in, in times of need. Substance. Um you might be uh, having to face a difficult battle, but isn't it good to go prepared, to go full of the Holy Spirit, to say, you know what, I might be asked some hard questions, I might have to 
face something I don't want to face, but you know what? I know God's with me. He's going to get me through it. I look at it that God provides what we need in the hour that we need it. Comfort, did he say comfort? Comfort, yes. Another big, big, massive one. Um, how can God renew and restore your strength when you're worn out? I, you anoint my head with oil. Um, I think oil and anointing is one of those things that we read about in Scripture, but we're like, what does that mean? Because I don't know about you, I hadn't anointed my head with oil at any point in time. Anybody this morning go and get some Crisco? and a nap nowadays. Huh? A nap during the day. Um, <laughs> the idea of that anointing with oil, it was that picture of, of being refreshed. Um, you think about, what do you do after a long journey? You've driven two hours and you finally get to the place, or even longer than that, and you're tired. What do you get? What do you need? Rest. What you say when you get up in the mornings when you've had a good night's sleep and rest, you get up, you should be rested and ready to ready to go. Yeah. Uh, you, a lot of times afterwards you want something to eat, you want some rest, and I'll tell you a big one, I want a shower. You know, if you've been out, if you've been got a long long journey or something like that. And you know, getting a good, nice hot shower after everything and just wiping all that off, you get refreshed. A lot of that, the anointing with oil, that was what was being talked about here. It was that refreshing that you get. So what kind of refreshing does God, God give in times like that? I, I'll give you one. Um, having nights like this is refreshing. Because for so often we, we don't get to be around believers if we if we work and we go out where they're non-believers or um, you you have you know all the all the rough stuff that goes on during the week when you're able to come back together isn't it just fun talk talk sit laugh tell stories about sheep I mean that's just good so I think that is uh, one of the things. Yeah, he's a bunny rabbit's getting close. So he wants to. Hey, hey, you come on. I'll do it. He he I, got a, I got notes for him. He's watching you now. I'll I tell you, you what. We set some notes down for him. His face is want, we on the back side right here. Yeah. So <laughs> you can come on up. You can read verse 6 if you want to. Um, <laughs> we got this idea also uh, of the cup running over. What, what does that symbolism mean for y'all? The cup running over. More, Sounds messy, you got doesn't more it? More comfort than you can handle and know what to do with it. I, I like that. You got more comfort than you know what to do with. You know, you just like bleeding comfort and bleeding share, blessings. You need to share it with somebody else. There we go. It's just overflowing in one's life. You ever thought, you know, you're just so happy you just don't know what to say? You got, you know, you it's have like so much you want to get out, but you just can't do it. More than you can handle. Yep. More than you can get filled up in your life. It's kind of like a smile, too. When you yep. smile, it, it, you over, your joy is, you're overflowing with joy, and, uh -huh. it, and it kind of, it kind of is contagious. Some, Make mm -hmm. somebody else smile. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, a little more to smile than it does to frown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that uh, we learned in seminary was, if you have a if you have a crowd of people, it is easier to tell a joke in a good crowd of people than it is with a bunch of people spread out, because laughter is contagious. Because one person laughs, that makes the other person laugh, and it just kind of it rolls like that. When you spread out, it's more difficult because there's just that distance that's there. The idea of the cup running over. It's, it's in your life, and it's spilling out to other people. And it, it's just that big that it, it hits other people in that manner. Um, how does this verse change our outlook when facing troubling times? How does this change us? How does this encourage us? That is a comfort. Yeah. That, that verse is a comfort. Think about David, how many uh, enemies he had. 
And these were like real deal enemies. They had swords, they had spears, they had bows and arrows. But he go back to this. You prepare me a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When we face something in our life that's rough, this is true. God is going to provide and God is going to bless and help us. All right, real quick, because I know my time is probably up. I can feel it. My preacher sense is going off. Uh, verse 6 is God's steadfastness and salvation. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How do we feel when something chases us? Better yet, has something ever chased you before? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. It's a snake. The scared. snake. <laughs> she sent me this swing. Snake, snake came after you. Well, I'm, it's not a fun I don't one. know that I've ever been chased by one, but I would be very scared if it did. Okay. Oh, you die if one chased you. <laughs> you would you would set a new land speed record. Yeah. So, what about anybody else been chased? When I was um, first church, my pastor. I was mowing the lawn, push the lawn mower, and I had um, I had sandals on, and uh, push the lawn mower going back forth, back forth, ran over a yellow jacket's nest. That was not a very good, fun feeling, because I didn't realize this: yellow jackets follow you. They will chase. They chase me inside. Take your pants off and no wide open. Space. Well, I had shorts on, so. <laughs> There wasn't much pants left. They chased me, and I ran. I don't, um, that feeling they're coming after me, and they're going to get me. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the turnaround on that. What David was saying here, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to read our little last, this is the last little bit. It's not, this is two little paragraphs. Finally, David concluded, surely goodness and love or mercy will follow me all the days of my life, even when he found himself in life-threatening situations. Through thick and thin in every extremity of life, God's blessings were chasing David. Thus, on a triumphant note, David wrote, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even death would ser uh, serve David's greater good, which would, ra which would usher him into God's immediate presence where he would enjoy the goodness and love of God forever or literally throughout the years. Nothing can celebrate, separate the believer from the love of God. So think about this. David was saying God's blessings are chasing me. Doesn't that give you a good feeling? What if there's a person chasing you with a you know, big old stack of $100 bills and they're going to like, when they catch up, they're just going to stuff it in your pockets. You'd, just, you'd walk slow, wouldn't you? You'd be like, oh, I tripped. Come on, get me. That's the idea behind it. God was saying, or David was saying, God's blessings are literally chasing me all the days of my life. And you know what? It, we, we get this idea of this question, how, we, how should we fear if God's goodness and love and mercy are chasing us? We ought to feel pretty good about that. Here's the question that uh, I want to I want to focus on. Have you ever had a sure thing? Absolute sure thing beyond death and taxes. You ever had something that was sure? Like a I, I know we usually use it in the in the idea of a bet. You know, this is a sure thing, this horse is gonna win or something like that. But anybody ever had ever had a had a sure thing? Grace asked, she doesn't know it yet. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> you had a sure thing um, because your teacher gave you a homework pass, right? Oh, yeah. Your math in, teacher. In math, you got a homework pass. Yeah, once, yeah sure. A sure quarter, thing, wasn't it? Wasn't it once a quarter? Once a quarter, you had a, you had a sure thing, right? So when you turned that in, how did you feel? So you're like, eh. Free. I'm about ready to say, I'm a, I, I know your math teacher. I can talk to him and say, well, you shouldn't give those out anymore. <laughs> they don't make your two students feel good. This mother you felt relieved, didn't you? You felt relieved. You were like happy because you didn't have to do the homework. 
right? You're like, I don't have to do the homework now. I just turn that in and go, boom, there it is, right? That's that, that feeling of sure thing, right? Mm -hmm. You get that coupon, you get to go in and get a free Big Mac or, or what, whatever, I don't know. Well, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling when mm -hmm. you do have that. Yeah. Because last Wednesday, I had a customer of mine, I told she knows, I get real short of breath sometimes mm. when I bend over when it's work. And she had seven horses to be trimmed. Oh, wow. And seven get, horses? Four. Seven. To be trimmed to feet. And uh, on Wednesday morning, I was going in there and I said, Lord, you've got to do this today. Mm -hmm. I can't do it myself. I trimmed them horses, got in my truck, and re left before I realized that I hadn't been very short of breath. You got through it all. Yeah, got, got through it. Amen. 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 And then, God just surely got you through that just as, as easy as anything else. Did you have big feet or little feet? <laughs> big feet. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm like that rabbit boy. He just... He's just getting me, boy. He's oh. enjoying this service. Yep. Well. I just need to keep on praying. We need to do Psalm 119. He'll be in here. He'll be joined by the end. I love it because he stands up. <laughs> and he, lay, he lays down and lays still. We're going to have to name him. He's going to be the Mars Hill Rabbit. we got to name him. Think of a name for the bunny. Um, Mars? <laughs> yeah, we name him Mars here. But that's the idea. It changes who we are. It changes our outlook when we have that sure thing. We have confidence. We have we have peace. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of our life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have that security. So just going to the end, to the application, so we can go ahead and finish here. I just wanna I wanna get this one, these two questions out of the way. How does this verse change how we look at life? How does this verse change? change how we look at life, and also, how can these verses help us count, counsel someone who is going through difficulty? How does these verses, how, how does Psalm 23, how does it change the way we look at life, and how does it help us counsel someone? Well, just the last part there is a reminder again that God's in control mm -hmm. and that in the end, we're, we're headed to live in his house forever. Amen. That's right. We already know the end. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I know it's behind me, but I know it's before me, right? How do we counsel somebody? What can we say? How can we go and turn, if somebody's going through a rough time, we can turn to Psalm 23 and say, look, I want to, I want to take you, I want to show you a verse here. How does that help us counsel somebody? Here's what I would do. I'd go, you know what, if you know Christ as your Savior, everything that's true for David as he writes this is true of you. God is your shepherd. Therefore, he's going to provide for your needs. And not only that, he is, he is going to bless you through that. The Lord is your shepherd, you shall not walk. He will do the things if you will let him to calm you down and give you peace to give you rest. He will restore whatever is in your soul. He will be able to restore your life and lead you in the paths of righteousness. But even though you go through the valley of the shadow of death, don't forget this. The Lord has a shepherd's crook to help draw you back, and he's got a rod to beat back all your enemies. And you know, even though your enemies are all around you, God's going to provide because he's bigger than your enemies. And beyond that, there's blessings that are chasing you. And they're going to follow you all the days of your life. You're going to see them wherever you go. And remember, at the very end, you have a place, not on this earth, but in heaven above. There's so many little applications, and I love it because everybody knows this verse, and everybody knows this passage. So this is a great jumping-off point for us to say, hey, you're going through a rough time. Let me, let me help you. You don't even need your Bible on hand because everybody basically has memorized this before. So that, I hope, can, can help us and can encourage us. Let's go ahead as we, uh, as we close up, as we're losing sunlight.
That's all right. Uh, Bunny's got to go to bed here soon, too. He might be saying, I want to go to sleep. You're being loud. Let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer. Father.